want to say good morning to our visitors and those that are watching us via uh, internet, Facebook, or social media, to those at Blessed Hope. Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 If you would, just for a moment, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Ecclesiastes. That's in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, page 985. If that's going to help you. I know it'll help one person. 985, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're going to start reading at verse 12 through verse 26 would be our unit of thought for this morning. Everyone standing, if you can, with your Bibles open as I read aloud. Read along with me in your Bibles silently. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 12. Ecclesiastes. Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse number 12, and it reads this way, and it says, And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do that cometh after the king? Question, even that which has been done already. Then I saw that wisdom excelled folly as far as light excel of darkness the wise man's eyes are in his head but the fool walketh in darkness and i myself perceive also that one event happening to them all then said i in my heart as it happens to the fool so it happens even to me and why was i then more wise question then i said in my heart that this is also vanity for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten and he dieth the wise man question as the fool therefore i hated life because i worked that which is wrought under the sun and grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of the spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I have taken under the sun. Because, listen, I should leave it unto a man that shall be after me. And who, who knoweth whether he shall be wise or a fool. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have shown myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For this is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity, but yet to a man that has not labored therein, shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity. Notice, and it says, and a great evil. For he had, for has the man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he has labored under the sun. For all his days are sorrow and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taken not rest in the night. This is also vanity. Verse 24 says, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or, or who can hasten unto more than I, speaking of Solomon, he said, for God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But, here's the transition, but to the sinner he giveth travail together to heap up, to heap up that he may give him that is good, that is good before God. This is vanity and vexation of spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. Uh, once again for uh, just this day's journey. Thank you for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. We thank you for life, health, and we thank you for strength as we come now to the point of the service where we break the bread of life. I pray now that you would lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom, that you would anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. 
you'll give me preaching power from on high that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me now decrease while you increase. That they always hear from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeem. God bless you all and thank you. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you from a continuing theme, life under the sun as we continue our series of sermons in the book of Ecclesiastes, we own number four, part four. And I want to use what subject this morning, the pursuit of materialism, the pursuit of materialism. This book is written by Solomon, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. Solomon is searching for the answer to the age old question, what is the meaning of of life. And I know at some point in time we've asked ourselves why am I here? Why has God created us? What is the purpose? This life uh, old question, uh, what is the meaning of life? Solomon confessed that much that we can't understand nor can we control. You have many today are at the point of, of uh, futility and void in their life, emptiness and vain. Many have uh, bank accounts, many have 401ks, many have savings accounts, many have cars in their garages, big houses, and seeing that everything they want in life, but yet it's still not enough. One of the epidemics that is going on in our society today, in America today, is called depression. You got more folks today are depressed, committing suicide, when it appears from the outward perspective that they have everything to live for, but yet in having everything does not make you happy. Yeah. Solomon did this experience and many people uh, today are suffering because they're chasing after the wind running, as, as mom and them used to say, running with the Joneses, trying to keep up with everyone else. They're searching for a new thrill in life but what is the purpose and the benefit of life is it to buy to get and to gain what is the purpose and why are we here is the question that solomon is asking here life has a a purpose life has a a meaning the writer said what pur pur purpose a uh, prosper a man to gain the whole world and in turn lose his soul what will you give in exchange for your own soul, your own soul. God has prospered us. God has woke us up, given us life, health, and, and strength. But many have looked over that. But what is the benefit of life? When life is over, and one day Solomon's going to say, we're all going to die as the Hebrew text says. But when life is over, what is the benefit of this life that we live today? All that we have accumulated over the years. All of the wealth we have accumulated, all of the stuff that we have accumulated, when we die, what is the purpose? There's three things I want us to notice as we think on the subject, the pursuit of materialism. We're talking about Solomon here, his dissatisfaction of life revealed. The second thing is his despair of life recorded. And thirdly is the delight of life that is reviewed. But notice Point number one, the first thing I want us to notice is his dissatisfaction. So many people chasing the wind, searching for the meaning of life. Why has God uh, created us? Why has God put us here? What is the purpose for life? When this life is over, what's the benefit? All the wealth that you have accumulated in life. Paul Solomon here continues his experiment that he has in in life, Solomon here was the richest, wisest man, so he conducted an experiment. But notice, first of all, his consideration there in verse 12. And he said, And I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king? Question, even that which has been already. Done. He said, I turned myself. Solomon said, I had to refocus. I had to reposition myself. I had to refocus my, my thought. He, refo he refocused what has already taken place. Solomon was the wisest and also the richest. You remember in 1 Kings 
Uh, God asked Solomon, what does he want? And, and it was some of us, we would have said a whole lot of different things. But Solomon said, give me wisdom in order for me to guide my people. And God gave him wisdom. And he also said, because you did not ask for riches, he made Solomon also the richest man that has ever lived. Solomon had taken God's wisdom and all that God had given him, and he mismanaged it. He misused God's wisdom. You remember Solomon here said to be, uh, he was going to consider a refocus on what had already taken place. The experiment of the wilderness and pleasure and women and wine. And Solomon comes to the conclusion that the things of the world does not produce a lasting satisfaction. I don't care how many cars you have or how many houses you have, how many women you have. I don't care how much you drink and eat and fare and marry. And all of this, it does not bring happiness in the end. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and they all turned his heart to worship uh, after another god. Solomon didn't totally abandon God. He just added more gods to the gods that he served because of the women that he was worshiping. And he said, for as I considered all the worldliness, all the pleasure, all the women, all the wine, and it has no value. Solomon says the world does not bring satisfaction. And it says, oh, the man. And it says, now Solomon is conducting a test. And Solomon simply says, anyone that comes after me that conducts the same test will come up with the same conclusion that life apart from Christ is empty. Solomon being the wisest man that there is, he said, no one that can come after the king will come up with a different uh, ending than what I have, that life apart from Christ is meaning. But the question is, can we learn from the mistakes that others have made? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. How often have we been growing up and our mom or grandmother have told us this, you don't want to do that, you don't want to do this, you don't want to go down that road, but we have the mindset that I'm grown and I know everything. And I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. But Solomon uh, simply is saying here, he's setting the, the, the pattern, he said, oh, oh, the man, he's, his life is setting the pattern for the ones to follow him. So we have to, he said, I refocus what is the person uh, that's going to follow after me after I die. How is he going to respond and how is he going to live? See, many will live their life never realizing that others are watching them. Others are mimicking them. And if you have a child and you understand that the child normally will mimic what he sees in the home. He's going to follow behind the pattern of the mother of the father. So we have to realize when we live our life that others are watching us and they're also mimicking us. I remember growing up and they asked what person you most like want to be like. Back then it was either your mother or your father because they pattern after us. So his consideration here, Solomon says, I, I had to refocus my, my life and understand that folks are following me, they're, they're mimicking me and basically there's nothing new under the sun. Whoever comes after me conducts the same experiment will come up with at least the same answer that I come up with because there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is the same. It may have a new twist or a new color or a new face, but it's all the same, but notice the caution in verse 13 and 14. It says, Then I saw that wisdom, wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. It says, The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in, in darkness. Notice the caution. It says, Then he says, God's wisdom is far better than folly, then light is better than darkness. He gives the contrast here of how good God's wisdom is compared to the folly of this world. It is the folly of the world that cancels out God. It is the folly that says we need no prayer uh, in school. We've forgotten God. We've cast God out. It's the folly 
of the world that says that the LGBTQ has the right to mandate what it is that they can and cannot do. It's the folly of the world that said it's all right for two women or two men to be married. He said the wisdom of God is far better than the folly of the foolishness that we find in this world in which we live. They don't want no prayer in the schools, but the first time something happens in the school, they want to ask, where is God? I would say, which one? The one that you cast out? The one that you don't want in here? But that's the folly uh, uh, of this world. That wisdom of God is far better. Everyone is going to heaven. There's no hell or there's no heaven. We all just die. That's just the end of it. But the wise man can avoid danger while the fool gets in trouble as though he stumbles around in the darkness. There's two pathways here. Either you're going to walk in wisdom or you're going to walk in darkness. But Solomon said the end result is they both shall die. So Solomon said, what's the point? If I excel or if I don't, if I am wise or if I'm a fool, if I gain all of this and I don't, what's the difference? Because everybody is one day going to die. Whether you're wise or whether you're a fool, you're still going to die. So he asked the question, why is it so important that I be wise if we're all going to end up in the same spot? I think it's a valid question, but I don't want you to, to get the idea that Solomon is saying it ain't worth it. That's not what he's saying at all. He's simply doing an experiment and simply saying it's all going to come out the same that we all walk, whether you walk in darkness or you walk in light, both will die. Hebrews 9 and 27 says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment that were appointed in the Greek aorist tense means something that was already uh, considered in time past, but still have implications today. Simply meaning before the earth was born, God had already determined the day that we're going to be born and the date we're going to die. God already has it on his prophetic calendar in heaven. The date that we're all going to die is appointed. That's a date that we're all going to have with death. One day, every last one of us will die. And then when we die, then what? All that we have accumulated. What is what good is it if I'm dead? If I spent all of my life in school, if I spent all of my life in, in college, I spent all of my, my, my life uh, saving and all of my life in getting and gaining, what's the purpose if I'm going to die and I'm going to leave everything behind? I can't take anything with me. It's important to us to die whether you're wise or or a fool, I put dumb in here, but I really meant to put a fool, which is the same thing. <laughs> Whether you work, your unemployment doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're all going to die. So he asked the question, how should we then live knowing that death is coming? How should we live? Knowing that one day, each one of us in here will die. And that's just not an experiment. That's fact. If the Lord tarries and the rapture does not come, we all will die. And one day we'll stand before that bar of God, the judgment seat of God. Many get caught up in sin, but I want you to understand sin is only for a season. You can enjoy sin, but it's for a season. You ever notice how we watch a lot of these shows? And I don't know why my wife, I sit there with her and we watch the <coughs> Lifetime shows. In the end, it's always sin. You know, they always commit adultery or you murder somebody. But in the end, the scripture says your sins shall find you out. It's only for a season that you're going to enjoy your sinful condition because God's going to bring it to pass. Amen. Amen. The scripture says the soul that sinner shall surely die. God's wisdom provides insight in how we ought to live our life today. Proverbs 3 and 13. Let me read that one. Proverbs 3 and 13 says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Happy is the man to fear God is, to, is the beginning of, of wisdom. But notice not only the consideration of caution, but notice the conclusion there. In verse 14, see, in that night points out three things. First of all, look at the universal faith. And look at the latter portion of verse 14. And it says, and I myself considered also 
that one event happening to them all. That's the universal faith. The common denominator, the great equalizer is death. There is a 100% assurance that everybody will die. 100%. That's guaranteed I'm willing to bet my paycheck on it. If you keep on living, one day the Lord does not tarry. We all die. Death is short. And many don't realize just how short life is. Here today, and you're going to tomorrow. A good friend of mine's son passed away, was uh, kidnapped a year ago. They just found the body just two, three days ago, a week or so ago. The young man was about 18, 19 years old. Life is short, but we don't know when we're going to die, some sooner, some later, but the universal faith, the great uh, equalizer is death, and everybody will die. The rich man has a story that I love so much called the rich man in Lazarus. The rich man fared sumptuously. Every day Lazarus sat at the gate and he was full of, of sores. But it says, and they both died. Everybody's going down. I don't care how, how rich you are, uh, how good looking you are, whatever the case may be. A man that's born of a woman shall die. And there's no such thing as soul sleep. There's no such thing as when you die, you're simply going to simply just go to the grave. And once death comes, that is all. It says after that, there is the judgment. There is life after death. There's two destinations. The rich man, he went to hell. And Lazarus, he went to heaven. That's the destination. It's heaven or hell. There's no such thing as soul sleep. There's no such thing as compartments in hell. Some people would tell you there's no heaven, there's no hell, you simply die, and it's all over. But the universal faith is faith, F-A-T-E, is death. But notice the universal forgotfulness there in verse 16. And it says, and for there is no remembrance of the wise more than the fool forever, seeing that which is now in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And he dieth, the wise man, as the fool, regardless, or uh, my favorite word, irregardless, I know it's not a word for those that may be looking, I know that, but I love the word irregardless, no matter who you are, what position, power, prestige, all will die, and also you're going to be forgotten. It's one day we're saying they're going to ask the question, who was Pastor Edwards? He was the founding pastor of Blessed Hope Missionary Baptist Church. Not only am I going to die, but they're, they're going to forget that I ever lived. If you don't believe me, I just wrote down a couple things. Who was O.J. Simpson's wife? Who shot Martin Luther King? Who shot Abraham Lincoln? Who won the Super Bowl two years ago? Who was the first black heavyweight champion of the world? Not only are they dead, but they're forgotten. We have totally forgotten those who have lived and they died. And but yet, Solomon say, but not only am I accumulating, I have riches, I have homes, I have cattle. Not only am I going to die, but they're going to forget about me. One day they're going to ask the question of all of us in here, will die and no one is going to remember us. We all will be forgotten, dead and gone. You can go out to the cemetery and you can find some graves that are not being kept. You want to know why the graves are not being kept? Because they forgot about the person that's in the grave. Solomon said, listen, here's the, here's, the, here's the test. He said, I've accumulated all of this wealth. Now, one day I'm going to die. I can't control it. Listen, but not only am I going to die one day, there will be no existence of us. They will have no clue of all of any of us. But notice the universal utility there in verse 17. And it says, therefore, you got to stop and look what went therefore. Verse 16, he said, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all its vanity and vexation of spirit, where vexation of spirit gives us the idea of beating the air. Are you trying to, to, to grab the, the air? It's an impossibility for us to grab and hold on to air. And this is what he said life is. Life is like he said, I hate it. Like he said, I look back over my life, I refocus on all the folly 
the madness of the world, the women, the wine that comes. He said, in conclusion, Solomon said, is I hated life. Solomon said, I, you know, I, I'm the king. You know, we worked hard to get what we have. We worked hard to accumulate all that we have, knowing now that we're going to die and leave it all behind. Solomon said, that's grievous to me to know that as hard as I'm working, that I'm going to die, and one day I've got to leave it all to somebody else. Solomon said, they just might be a fool. <laughs> that's what he said. Now, his words, not mine. He said he might be wise, but then again, they might be a fool. But he says that women and wine in the world come to the conclusion that I hate it like Solomon recognized that he looked back over his life and where he's been and where he's gone. He recognized the tracks and the trail that God had had him on. He looked over uh, some of his missteps, his failings and fallings, and he's getting back up. And he looked back and he said this is how, listen, that I was living, but he said, this is not how God wants me to live. We all can look back over our life and say, I may not be all that I should be, but thank God I'm better than what I used to be. Solomon said, I look back over all of my mistakes, and I realize apart from Christ, there is no satisfaction. All that, that, that has been done at the end of life, he said he found his vanity. Many, while on their deathbed, will say, you know what? If I would if I would if I would have changed my mind, or what if I've gone in a different direction? What if I've made better, better decisions? Or what if I had a better father or a better mother? Many will sit on their deathbed and ponder, oh, I should have did this or I should have did this. Maybe if I wouldn't have done this or did this, my life would have been better. Life can be have meaning. If your life is sold out for Christ. Let me say it again. If y'all missed this. Life can have meaning. Only if it's sold out for Christ. Yeah. You don't want to get to the end of your life. And you live the life 80, 90 years. And you sit there and you say, well, you know, I could have did. You know, I could have achieved this. What if I would have made better decisions? What if I... What, what about what about I did this or I did this if I wouldn't have did this? You want to look back over your life like Paul said, I, I finished the course, I kept the faith, I did exactly what God has called me to do. When I look back over my life, I want to say that listen, this is a life that was worth living for God. Yeah. The pursuit of materialism. We look at point number one, his dissatisfaction, but notice his despair. In verse 18 through 23, notice his concern there. In verse 18, it says, Yea, I hated all my labor, which I have taken under the sun, because, here's, here's the reason, because, cause for, I should leave it unto a man that shall be after me, and knoweth, and who knoweth whether he shall be wise or fool. That's Solomon. Solomon said, I've accumulated and I'm going to die. You're going to forget about me. But what's grievous is I have no control over what happens when I die, what I leave behind. I don't know what you're going to do with it. He said, I don't know if you're going to be a fool or whether they're going to be wise. But Solomon looked back and he hated what he saw in his life because he was concerned about who was going to get his wealth, who was going to get the accumulation of all the stuff that we worked so hard for. Listen, this is a statement that I wrote. Uh, and it says, and a person who inherit inheritance, inherited, who has not worked for it, who has no real appreciation for it, might be a fool and squander it. Solomon said, if you never worked for it, you never learned to appreciate it, and you just might squander it. Solomon said, I'm the one that labored for it. I appreciate everything that I have worked for, but when I die, the person that comes behind me just might be a fool. I spent all my life working. In a matter of three, four, six months, you have squandered the whole life savings. This is what Solomon is saying. He's worried about two things. First of all, he's worried about the, the unknown. Solomon says in verse 18, finish 19, it says, Ye shall know, you shall not have the rule. Over all my labor wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This 
is also vanity. It's empty and void. He said, I showed myself, listen, proficient in all I've done, but now I'm going to die and all I have, I'm going to leave it behind to somebody who might squander it and misuse it. Solomon said, I've worked, I've planned, I've plotted. Solomon said, I've got land and bank accounts. I've got a 401k, a Roth, RA. I've got a savings account. I've got houses and cars. I've got money. He said, but I'm worried about what's going to happen when I die. Where is it going? Have anybody ever thought about that? You know, I worked hard. You know, I sacrificed vacations. I sacrificed doing this in order to gain the wealth. So when I retire, I can have this, this, and this. But one day I'm going to die. And what's going to happen to all of the money that I've accumulated when I die? I'm going to pass it on. What's going to happen? Solomon said, you know, that's grievous to me. Now, Solomon can say that because he was rich. You know, if you got a few dollars here, it might not matter. But when you're a gazillionaire, you got houses everywhere. You got uh, Bugattis, two, three million dollar cars parked in. You know, it, it might make a difference to you. All that he that he has, he says, where is it going? Who is it go? Who's going to get it? And after death, who's going to get it? Now most people set a wheel, so they cross their eyes and dot their T's. And you say, I know just how uh, my money's going to be dispersed. No, you don't. Know. You know, mom and dad, grandma and them to set out of their will. I want so and so and so and so to get this. You would think that that was going to happen, but it's not always that way. They spend more money in courts breaking the will than we can imagine. Because they know you don't deserve this. See, because when mama was sick, you weren't there. You weren't nowhere around. You didn't take it to the doctor's appointment. You don't deserve the house. You don't deserve this. You don't. We're breaking the will, but it was mom's desire. But you say, this is my desire. But she said, this is what I want. He said, this is what I want. And you go to your grave thinking that it's going to happen, and it may not happen. All of us say it might not go that way. Because it might not, you no, know, these kids might not act that way. They say, no, they spend more money in courts trying to break the will. And many are successful in doing it. Just because you wrote it down, don't mean that that's the way they're going to, they're going to divide it up. Solomon says, grievous, you can dot your eyes and cross your teeth, set a will if you want, but when you're dead, you have no idea of who's going to get what. Solomon said, that's, that's, that's troubling. That's troubling to me. And I got a problem with, I got a problem with that. Many homes after death are in battles and, and shambles because the families are torn apart over who's going to get what in the estate. Even when it's already etched out so-and-so gets this, so-and-so gets this. But we have the idea, no, they don't deserve it. I do. That's when greed set in and covenant set in. And you said, no, I want this because I deserve it. You don't deserve it. So I said, do we really know what's going to happen when we, when we die? You know, I, I, I worked hard for all of, all of this. Do we really, really know? And many have the mindset when your mom or dad are, are up in age and, and they're just eating up the money with medical bills, and, you know, and, and doctor's bills. That, that there is a a, a a a retirement, but yet because they're sick and won't die, they're eating up the money. So the kids, I wish you would hurry up and die so I can get the money because in the end there'll be no money because you're using it up in doctor's bills. How many kids you think that knock their parents off because they wouldn't die on their own? By the time you get done, it won't be nothing, it won't be nothing left. Because they want the money now. And that's why a lot of the not lot a lot of the people now are why they're alive, they're dispersing what they want everyone to have when they're alive. And I remember um who was it? Uh Ray Charles. Ray Charles gave all his kids the inheritance while he was alive. He said, this is what I want y'all to have. I'm going to give it to you so when I die, there'll be no bickering, there'll be no disputing over who's going to get what. And Rehoboam was the successor of Solomon, his son, and he followed after his footsteps, in his footsteps. It didn't take Rehoboam six months before he totally tore down the kingdom because he wanted to side with the young people and not the older generations. He followed after in his own 
a father's footstep, but not only the unknown, but notice that which is uncontrollable. Look at verse 20 and 21. It says, therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man who has labored in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity, but yet, yet to a man that has not labored therein, shall he leave it for his portion, for this is vanity and great evil. He said, now, I, you know, <laughs> if I leave it behind to somebody, who have not worked for it, they won't appreciate it, and they're going to squander it. But you have no control over your possessions when you die. You cannot control who will get your possessions or what you have. You really and honestly, you don't have no control once you're dead because many kids will do exactly what they want to do. But we will tend to think that I set my will up, and this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be nice and easy. They're going to go in. They're going to sit down at the table. The, the lawyer is going to open up the package. He's going to say, okay, you get this, 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 and this. Everybody's going to be happy. Everybody's going to go home. And in some cases, it happens. But in some cases, that don't happen. You know, the money is hung up in court. They spend more of the money on lawyers than money they will receive if they just accepted what they had. Many of them will squander it. You have houses that have been in the family for 20, and 30, 40, 50 years. They give it to the child, and the child turns around and loses the house. The house is already paid for. All you have to do is pay the taxes on the house, but yet you still lose the house. How many folks have lost it, squandered the whole 401k? All of the savings in a matter of six or seven months. So Solomon says it's, it's not only is it unknown, but it's, it's uncontrollable. How many make decisions in life? How are we going to live and who are we going to give it to? Solomon said it's unknown. And after I'm dead, it's uncontrollable. I cannot uh, control what's going to happen once I die. Solomon's words of despair. He's lost hope and he cannot control the future after death. Solomon here says it's unknown. I don't know who's going to get it. It's uncontrollable and once they get it, I have no control over how they're going to spend it. The person or the child, and in most cases, it's the heir. The, the child is going to get the inheritance from the parent, but you don't know what. You, well, you might know, depending on your child. Everybody knows their their children. That's why parents don't leave certain things to certain kids because they know that that wouldn't be very wise for them to have money or well, you know, but you know. But we never, we, we don't, we don't know. That's why the Bible says we are to lay up treasure. In, in heaven, that's where the treasure we ought to be concerned about because the treasure down here, moth and rust eating one day, it won't even exist but many Christians have the mindset of getting and gaining the world but they never stop to consider what would God have them to do with their lives. When we wake up in the morning and we say, God, what would you have me to do today? As young people you ask God, God, what would you have me to do with my life that you have given me? These are the questions that we ought to be asking. Lord, what would you have me to do? But the scripture said, what profits? What benefits a man to gain the whole world? And in the end, you lose your soul. The life is 78, even 10, 70 years. That, that life that we have compared to all of eternity. God wakes us up. God blesses us. What what benefit is it? You know, is it is it really beneficial for us to have all of this life in the end we just die and we go to hell? Notice the contemplation there. There's two things. There's the eternal value and the earthly vexation. The eternal value in verse in verse 22 it says, For what has a man of all his labor and all his vexation and heart wherein he has labored up under the sun. Solomon says, what is the value of it all? What is the purpose of us being here today? Why was I born? 
Many will search their lives, searching instead of spending time in the Word, surrendering to God, understanding what God wants our lives. He wants our heart. He wants our total surrender. When we die, we're going to leave it all behind. Like Job said, naked came out to the world and naked shall I return. I've never seen uh, a uh, hearse pulling a U-Haul. When you die, you're not going to take any, everything you accumulated, whether you love it, treasure it, whatever, you're going to leave it on this side of the grave. He said, you know, when I die, I'm not going to take nothing with me. I've never seen anybody take anything with them. They had two people standing at the casket and one looked at the other and said, how much did he leave? The other person, he left it all. Maybe you get that on your way home. If you didn't get that, you get He left it all. He left everything. You're not taking anything with you. You're going to leave the way you came. And, and Solomon understood this, that I've accumulated. I work hard. It's precious to me. But what happens if I die and a fool get a hold to it and squander all that I have made? Solomon say that is a great evil. The earthly vexation there. Many will spend their lives with the mindset of I gotta get more. I gotta get another dollar. I gotta get another, I gotta get another paycheck. That is the mindset of others saying, Lord, take my life and let it be always used for thee. Instead of having a mantra, Lord, what can I do? It's the more of getting and gaining. I got to get more. I've got to get another paycheck. I've got to get another dollar instead of serving God. We simply said, I've got to work. I've got to do this. I've got to do this because I've got to make money. But Solomon said in the end, we're all going to die. And what good is the money going to do you when you're dead? Just let that ponder for me. Because what's most important is your salvation, your relationship with God, because that's the only thing that's going to accompany you to the other side of the grave, whether you're lost or saved. Amen. Everything else you're going to leave for somebody to come up, kick that feet up on your couch that you bought, drink the Kool-Aid you paid for, sit and drive the car that you paid for. So I said, don't worry about it. It is all vanity. When you're dead, you're not going to worry about it anyway. But the counsel there, under the delight that is reviewed, that the counsel, he said, there's nothing better than a man would eat and drink and enjoy his labor. And I'm not talking about the great goose, the C45, the silver bullet. And we're just talking about regular Kool-Aid or tea or whatever it is you like to drink. There's nothing better than a man to eat and to drink and to be married. Notice his counsel of God's plan. Verse 24, and it says, There's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. God has created us to work. You can go back to Genesis. Even before the fall, he, they were to attend the, the garden. God has designed men to work, but some just won't do it. We live in a society with the mindset that's leaning towards a socialistic society. Many have the mindset of guaranteed income for everyone, medical for everyone, at no cost. It's called socialism. And the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. Just that simple. If you can't get a job and work, then you don't eat. The socialistic society say everything is given to everybody. Whether you work or not, it does not matter. If I can eat filet mignon, you can eat it too. But I work and you don't. The Bible says if you don't work, you, you don't eat. It's a society that everything is supposed to be given to you. You don't have to worry about working. You can go to college, spin up all of these bills and just have it forgiven. We're just going to erase all the debt. Now, why don't they do that on these house notes? Why don't you erase my mortgage? You want to help me out? Erase, forget the college. If you erase the mortgage, then I take care of the college. You want to help somebody out, but it's the mindset that I don't have to work for anything. Everything is given to me on a silver platter. God created us to, to work. And then the God's provision, he said there has to be satisfaction in our labor, our eating 
cannot be enjoyed without God's enablement. It said man should eat and drink and, and be married, not be married and die. That's not what he's saying. That we ought to eat and be married. We ought to be able to enjoy the fact that we labor, that we work, that we can come home. I can sit down at my table. I can eat and drink. And I can be just as satisfied as I can be. But that only comes with God's enabling you to do. How many folks you know that have committed suicide and they have plenty of food? have plenty of drink, plenty of money, and it's God that enables us to be able to enjoy what we have. Just because you have a large house and plenty of food, that's not going to make you happy. Just because you have a, a house, like they said, don't make it a, a, a home. You know, God has to give us enablement to enjoy all that he has provided for us as for a man to work as hard as many of us do. We ought to be able to come home, sit down, and enjoy the fruits of our labor. We ought to be able to enjoy the house that we purchased. We ought to be able to enjoy the food and, and the drink. We ought to be able to enjoy the sit down. And the fact that we have a flat screen television, we have video games. We ought to be able to sit down and to enjoy all that God has given us. But Solomon said, without the enablement of God, you still won't be satisfied, nor will you be happy. So many folks today... On suicide watch, plenty of them had food and, and drink and everything, but yet they still committed suicide because they was not content, because there's no contentment in the world apart from, from Christ. But notice verse 26, and I close his contentment. There Solomon comes to the conclusion that contentment only comes from God. Apart from God, life is meaningless and life is is empty. There's two things. We see the fulfillment of life and we see the futility of life. Verse 26, let me read the first part and it says, And God, God has given to man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy, but the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up, and he may give to him that is good before God. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. It simply said, in one text, it said, the riches of the world is laid up for the saints. All the money that is accumulated by sinners, in not every case, but in most cases, is laid up for the righteous or the saints. But notice the fulfillment of life, all that is good in life comes from God. I'm going to say it again. I don't know if y'all ready for this this morning, but I am. All that is good, it comes from God. Romans 8 and 28 says, All things worketh for the good of them that are called according to his purpose. Solomon realized that everything in life that's good came from God. Amen. That includes work. Solomon included work in this because it's designed in God's plan that a man ought to work. And if you work, you ought to be able to come home and enjoy the fruits of your labor. But only God gives us the ability to enjoy it. Many people work and still are not happy. Some folks have a home they don't even want to go to. Some folks get there and don't want to be there. There is no contentment apart from, from Christ. And lastly is the futility of life. And it says all the sinners... Gains is laid up for the saints. At the end of life that you live only have a fearful looking towards this place called hell. What profits us to gain the whole world? What profits us for God to give up life, hell strength, give us a life? And at the end of these 70, 80 years, you spend all of eternity in hell. You might want to ask the question, how long is eternity? Let me give you a good illustration. Everybody knows what a hummingbird is, right? one of the smallest birds that there is. And you know what the Atlantic Ocean is and the Pacific Ocean. That hummingbird will fly to one ocean, get a beak of water, fly 3,000 miles across the United States to the other ocean. When he dumped the Pacific into the Atlantic, that's the beginning of eternity. That's the beginning. Compared to 70 or 80 years, that you live on this life only to spend all of eternity in a place called hell. 
All you have to do is say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord because it's going to come a day that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God in the saddest words in all of the Bible. If God says, depart from me, you doer of iniquity, I never knew you. The rich man, he said, this day thy soul is required in hell. You don't want to live life in the end. Not only do you have to worry about who's going to get your stuff, but you got a bigger fish to fry if you find your place, your, 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 your life in this place called hell. It says, work wise yet day, because when night come, no man can work whatever we have. And I say this in, in closing, as we prepare to close, whatever we have, it came from God and it should be used for 